Hi everyone, and welcome to the first of our series in the Improving Healthcare with Simulation Workshops. I'm delighted to start this series off as a way to uh, really spread knowledge about the use of simulation within healthcare and how it can be used to improve, uh, improve processes and, and overall health systems. Um, today we're going to look at uh, emergency department throughput and uh, really using discrete event simulation as an effective tool for decision making. Now, delighted, um, Kerry, if you could just skip the slide there. Delighted to be joined by uh, Eric Hamrock from Johns Hopkins um, and Kerry Page from Novasim, a simulate partner. Uh, Eric, uh, as, a, as you can see, is a senior project administrator at Johns Hopkins Department of Operations Integration. Uh, just a quick background on Eric. Uh, Eric's career includes healthcare operational and process improvement experience in acute care, ambulatory, uh, home care, and long term care, care settings. Uh, a recent focus for Eric has been on inpatient bed flow and throughput in the emergency department. And that's using tools such as uh, discrete event simulation, Lean Six Sigma, and rapid improvement processes. Um, Eric, as we say, currently a senior project administrator and will be taking us through some of the work that Johns Hopkins has, uh, has been put in place over the, over the past few years. And particularly, they've worked very closely with uh, Novasim and Kerry Page from Novasim, uh, Simulate Partner, um, and a healthcare simulation expert, it has to be said. Um, just a little bit, Kerry herself is a 20 year simulation veteran and she's focused exclusively on healthcare process improvement for the past 12 years. Uh, she's worked very closely with healthcare organisations throughout the world um, to reduce costs, improve quality, and increase access to care. Um, and in addition to extensive experience with emergency departments, and Kerry's work really has touched on nearly every aspect of the healthcare system, including, again, ambulatory and inpatient settings, and ranges from very detailed models of scope processing to operating room scheduling. And as I say, delighted to be joined by um, such esteemed uh, members of the simulation and healthcare world, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to hand over to, um, to Eric and Kerry for that. Um, but first, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you could skip the slide, please, Kerry. Yeah, you'll see uh, as everyone's joined, uh, we're currently uh, muting everyone. Um, and that's really just so that we can keep the flow. Um, and uh, any questions that you do have, um, you'll see a chat panel down on your right hand side, or it will be on the drop down as you look up to the top. Um, and please uh, give, a, if you have any questions throughout, please type them in the chat panel. And if I can find the time to ask in between the, the presentation and the, the workshop, then I will do that. But if not, we do have a dedicated time at the end for some questions and answers. Um, so please uh, enter your questions into the chat panel. Uh, and also, uh, a, web, a full recording will be uh, sent to all registrations uh, as, we, um, as we complete. And I'll get that out to uh, everyone, hopefully, today or tomorrow. Uh, so as I say, it gives me a great pleasure to hand over to well, Eric, who's going to be taking us through some of the work at Johns Hopkins. And, um, take it away, over to you, Eric. Great. Well, thank you, Stephen. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is really how we've used discrete event simulation to make, decision make, to make decisions in the emergency department. A little background, our department here is called Operations Integration. And what we do, we report up through um, the COO and work with numerous clients throughout the organization. Um, one of those who's been very a good partner with us has been the emergency department. We're fortunate enough today to have uh, Jim Shulin on the line as well, who's the chief administrative officer. Um, the agenda today that we have is to first talk a little bit about what discrete event simulation is. Second, how do we set up a project for success? What are some of the things that need to go into the planning of that? And then how do we get the right information to, to come out with a simulation that's effective in making decisions? Um, Carrie's going to talk a little bit about validating the model, and then we're going to go into a couple case studies of the work that we've done in the last uh, 10 or so years. What I'll start with is what is discrete event simulation and why do we use it for decision making? Um, the first thing I, I think when we think about discrete event simulation is 
that it's a very predictive, uh, a powerful predictive analytics tool. Um, we're able to do a lot with it and, and to look at things and scenarios that, you know, we have gut feelings on what we want to do and, and things that we have ideas about, but it allows us to look into the future and to say, well, if we did this and made these assumptions, what would the outcomes of that be? Um, I think that it's very effective in, in settings such as the emergency department. As you know, there's a lot of variation and a lot of unpredictability, especially in how patients arrive. Um, we do work a, a lot with outpatient clinics and, and other areas where that's a little more predictable. Obviously, you can schedule patients in an outpatient clinic. You can um, sort of set up those arrival patterns. But in the emergency department, it's a little different. I think, though, in the data that we found, there are general patterns that happen throughout the day, and a lot of that's uh, focused on when patients arrive, but also how downstream departments operate and that sort of thing. Um, it's also useful, and I'll go into this in, in a minute, but it, it allows us to look at a wide range of what-if scenarios, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute. Um, one of the aspects I think that discrete event simulation brings to the table is it's a highly visual tool. And by that, I think what it allows us to do is to, to allow people to see complex systems in a very nice and, and kind of it's, it's interesting to people to see that simulated environment on their screen. And quite frankly, it's kind of sexy. It's kind of something that people look at and say, well, you know, this is interesting. We can see all the little uh, people going through the system and how do they interact and how does that work through those work queues. And then we can see hard data at the end of that. Um, along those lines, one of the things in working in, in different projects that, that I get involved in is we have to get different stakeholders to the table and get them involved and get them excited about a project. Um, you know, and, and that I, the people that I would work with would be physicians, nurses, or other frontline staff, and those could be from ancillary departments or from the department we're working with, and then administrators, finance uh, individuals, and then people, you know, other people that, again, sometimes patients are involved in the process. Um, we want to allow them to come and sort of get at the same sheet of music, see where we can agree, and then start to talk about what scenarios were, are possible. Um, it's a flexible tool. It's, if done right up front, we can provide different inputs and, and see how those work. And I think along the lines of bringing everybody to the same page, it allows us to have an environment of objectivity. So in other words, as I said a little bit alluded to, many times decisions in my experience, I, I used to be a, an administrator actually of um, nursing homes, and many of the decisions I would make were purely based on what I was hearing from my staff, what I was hearing people say in the units. And there were times where people would say, well, you know, we think this is what it is and this is what we should do. Well, it's nice to have a, a tool that we can use to say, well, this is what the data says, what it's doing. And then if they're, many times they were right, but that backs up that decision making. It allows us to have more confidence in those decisions. Um, and then finally, I think what we, we see with the discrete event simulation is it allows us and again, very complex systems. So if we're working between different care areas, how do those care areas affect each other and how does that, uh, the outcome affect, you know, our patients and our staff and, and otherwise. Next slide. So this is an example of a, a simulation that actually Carrie worked on with us um, for our Bayview site. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. But as you can see, uh, just to explain this, the, the characters in there are different colors, and those represent the different uh, areas that the patient would go through in the system. Um, our Bayview area has an observation unit, uh, so those are patients that aren't admitted but are, are being under observational status. Uh, minor care, so those less acute patients, the main ED, and then, you know, we have a trauma area. And as you can see, it's showing the arrival patterns of those patients. We use assumptions for those based on our internal electronic medical records. And we can see how often a patient comes, various distributions, and then 
what time of day those patterns are and, and looking at that. As you can see to the right as the simulation works, um, some of the outputs of it are average time in the ED. So as we make those assumptions, we can see, well, how long does the average patient stay in the ED? And then we can look below there at the number of patients that are in the ED, so um, census at any given point. And as you can see, that fluctuates depending on what time of day that you're looking at. Um, I think that, again, we've used this to, to bring it to the table for people to discuss, and I think that they've found it very interesting and very useful for, for those types of uh, problems that we've looked at. Um, in this instance, we were looking at expanding our capacity, and, um, you know, again, we'll go into that uh, example in a minute. Next slide. So some of the questions that we can ask, uh, and these are just some of them that we've actually asked here at Johns Hopkins in the past 10 years. Um, Carrie has been working with us for that amount of time and, and used discrete event simulation to, to, to give us those answers. One of them is, as I just said, what if we add capacity? What if we add space or staff? Um, you know, what does that do for us? I think many times, as, as you know, people say, well, if I just had more space or if I just had more staff, we could do this. Well, many times they're correct, but it gives us some hard evidence behind that to do that. I think what we also find is that simulation allows us to do it in a setting that's less risky. Um, as you could imagine, if we were to add staff and say, well, let's try to add a, another nurse to this shift, that costs money, that makes people have to perform their work in a different way. And it, if you're always changing those things, it's much easier to see the effects of it in a, in a non-risky setting using simulation. Um, you know, other questions, what if we change our practice patterns? What if volumes uh, go up or down? You know, what if we were to see a drop in volumes? Does that mean that we should shift our resources somewhere else? The much more realistic scenario is that vo more volumes are coming into our ED, and how do we accommodate them? Um, the other piece, what if we see different mix patients, so types of patients? As I spoke about it at our Bayview uh, campus, you know, if we have psychiatry patients, there's a different uh, process that goes into them as, a pair to, as opposed to main ED patients. So what if we all of a sudden were to see more of those or trauma patients? How does that affect the system? Um, we've also looked at boarding time, and, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with downflow of the um, accepting inpatient uh, units, so our medicine units. What if we were to do some things around there and to increase uh, the throughput there, what does that give us? And it, it, it kind of acts as a lever to, to sort of have that discussion with other, other departments. Um, looking at new models of care, fast track models and those sorts of things, short stay. And then many of the projects we do look at lean initiatives, so trying to come up with different processes where we eliminate the non-value added work. Um, you know, if we are able to do that, what kind of bang for our buck do we get? And I think that that allows us to, to leverage that with um, the executives and, and allows us to get buy-in into certain investments that, that might be needed in those areas. Um, and then finally, you know, what if we were to reconfigure the, the, the ED in the, the different settings? Um, one of the things I want to talk about now is setting up a project for success. So my role, uh, again, as a project administrator, I'm really interfacing with different stakeholders. And I think the first and most important thing when I get into a project, especially a, a simulation project, is that we have a strong project champion. And I'd like to take the time to recognize Jim uh, Shulin, who's our, our chief administrative officer here in our emergency department, as someone who's clearly um, you know, champion the use of simulation from a long time back. You know, it's a tool that's been used in manufacturing and other industries, but I think that he was really at the forefront of bringing in folks like Kerry. He has staff as well on his um, that faculty that, that really do this work well, and one of those is Scott Levin, who um, has also contributed to a lot of this work. Um, you know, having that clear champion who can give us a direction of where we want to go, that's what really sets us up to be successful. From there, I think it's very important that we define our scope. Um, anybody who's been involved in project management knows the, the you know, pitfalls of scope creep and, and 
you know, it's not a bad thing if we want to start asking different questions, but we need to be clear that our question is um, up front set and that we're focused on that. And as we find different things, then we can, we can increase with other projects or increase that scope in a methodical way. Um, another aspect that I, I think that's very important is to understand what data do we have available and where can that data be gleaned from. Um, fortunately, many, uh, many health systems now are going towards electronic systems and we can get that data on the fly and get it more in a real time basis. Previous projects that I've worked on, Sometimes that's not so much the case, and there's certain questions that the data still doesn't capture. So we have to go in there manually doing observations, understanding what the environment's like, and that can hamper things. Um, you know, again, the less robust the data is, at times the less robust the model will be. So we try to get data in any way we can, but I think it's important to assess that up front and to understand what's the environment that we're sitting in right now as far as data. Um, another good question that we have to ask is, is discrete event simulation really the right tool for this? Um, as people see it and see the power of it, people tend to say, well, let's use it for this, let's use it for that. And at times it can be overkill or it may not be the most appropriate thing to do. There might be other statistical methods that we can use to get the answers that we're looking for. So I think it's important that we don't just always say discrete event simulation is the right thing, although with us being involved in it, we, we think that. But I think there's times where we have to say, you know, is there a better tool or a more efficient or dirtier tool that would, would basically work better? Um, I, another point that I, I'd like to make is that we should always try to involve frontline staff. Uh, some of the challenges that we face when things don't go as well is if we, we think we know what the process is and we don't ask the people that are actually doing it, and then the model looks very different than what the reality is. And Carrie will talk about that a little bit in the validity um, validating uh, section. But I think it's important in any project that we understand what are the problems that the people that have to do the process are facing. Besides that, I think when we include them from the front, we're more successful when changes uh, are proposed. And frontline staff feels that they've bought into it and have helped design it. I think it's more likely to catch on. Finally, I just people that are involved in the simulation project in, in educating them in what discrete event simulation is and what they can do. It's, it's good for them to sort of frame in their head how do we need to think about this problem and, and how can the, the simulation be used to effectively come up with decision and scenarios that we can use to, to make changes. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a little model that it, it, from my standpoint of what I deal with as a project manager. I think that first, as I spoke before, it's important that we have the decision maker guiding the group and allowing them to know what it is that's expected. What does success of the simulation entail? So I have this question, this is the information that I want to get to help me make that decision, and then it's our job to help to, along with them, guide the simulation and, and the inputs to it. Um, as I just spoke about, frontline staff is important to have their input. And finally, the, the, the developer or the technical expert carry in this situation, she, it's important that we frame the information and the data in a way that it's easy for her to use. Um, I think my role many times is that, is, uh, is that of an interpreter or a translator, and it's really trying to identify from the frontline staff, they have a feel for what's going on and understanding what's going on, but it may not be as technical or in a data-oriented sense, and, and that's where in working with Carrie, it's trying to frame that and getting the data in a way where we have it clean, ready to use, and, and able for us to, to start building the simulation. Next slide, please. Um, this is a conceptual model, and we just recently, actually this month, had a publication come out in the Journal of Healthcare Management, and I'd welcome uh, you know, people to, to read it. It's a primer on using simulation in the ED, using the examples. Um, that, that we'll talk about. But this just really goes into what are the things that go into a simulation. So 
examples are volumes or arrival patterns, um, service time. And as you can see, we put those into probability distributions, focusing on, <clears throat> again, what are those arrival patterns. Once we put those into the simulation, then what we're looking to get are outputs, such as throughput, um, delays, so people waiting, what, what are the non-value-added things happening to the patient, um, capacity utilization, we can look at staff or other resources. And then what happens is we're able to come out with different performance improvement or design strategies. And can we change our scheduling? Can we change the way that we schedule our patients? Um, can we make incentives for patients to come at different times or, or, you know, looking at ways that we can redesign our work? And then finally, it goes back and in looking into what changes have to actually be made to the resources that we have, and we can ask that question again in, in changing the um, assumptions that we make. So on the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls um, that go into that whole process. And, and as I've alluded to many of these, scope creep is a big one. Um, it's kind of the, the good and the bad of simulation is it's so powerful that people get very engaged with it and want to ask every question that they've ever had. I think it's important that we make it clear that those questions are defined so that we can have effective information coming out. Um, the next thing is, did we really define the question clearly up front? And that really goes into the scope. Um, not having a project champion bought in. As I said, you know, if we don't have someone like Jim that's really driving the process and providing resources for it, I think that we set ourselves up for failure. And the same goes on the other end of things where the frontline staff may not be bought into the need to do this or the need to change. Um, so it's important that we manage that and are aware of that. Um, data, quality or accuracy of that is important. And again, I don't think that we can say just because we, do, we have a lack of quality data or very accurate data, that we still can't do a simulation. We just have to prepare contingency plans and, and processes to get that data. And then finally, as I spoke before, is really, is simulation really the right tool to use in that situation? Next slide. This is just uh, a conceptual model of the phases of simulation. So when we go into a project, this is how we're really thinking about it. Uh, the first being, let's analyze the process. Let's look at historical data. Let's understand what's really going on. Um, I'll go into a minute uh, flow charting. So looking how does the process work and what are those discrete events that we need to identify and <clears throat> capture so that we can build our model. Getting interviews and doing time studies. I think that this piece of the process really tends to be the majority of the project and where we learn a lot of things along with the actual modeling. Um, it's really understanding what is our current state. And then from there, once we've identified that, I think it gives us the base to, to then look to the future. Um, the modeling piece is the next, and that's where we configure the model, build the model, and then validate that data. And then we create scenarios. So looking at what are the different things that we want to ask and, and, you know, if we add six major care beds to the CD, what will that do for us? If we increase staffing on the night shift, what will that do for us as far as throughput, as far as wait time? And then once we've built those scenarios, we run the simulation, report that information back, and the team can look at that. And then what normally happens is you can see we loop back and it informs us to ask the next question. So it, we can do many iter iterations of this and in, in looking at, well, let's tweak this, let's tweak this, and see what those outputs are. Um, as I spoke, uh, the next slide is in the process analysis piece, um, it's important that we map the process out. And this is an example of our Bayview model uh, of a just I, what I wanted to show here is just how a typical process map would look. Um, as you can see, the, the pentagons at the beginning are the beginning of the process, the arrivals. Um, the diamonds are decision points, and that in our model indicates cues or wait times that occur. The blocks are work process areas where we're actually processing the work, and the, the oval, the oblong ovals are the end of the process, so that's when we've completed the work. Um, if you'll move on to the next slide, Carrie. 
Well, what we normally would do then is take that process map and lay that out into the simulation as you can see here. Um, again, we've taken the, um, basically the floor plans for our ED and laid that process out as far as what pathway could a patient go. So as you can see at the bottom, we have the main ED. There's a specific process that goes into that, and we have to identify what is the work process time for that? What are the steps that have to go into that? And are we capturing every piece of that? And again, as you saw before with the simulation working, um, it gives us clear output um, that we can start to, to look at and identify. Um, I want to turn it over now to Carrie and talk a little bit about as we build these models, we want to get the data and validate that data to make sure that we have a clear picture of what's really going on in the ED. So Carrie, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Eric. Um, that was a, a great explanation of, of the major first part of the process. And after all of that, we end up with a, a draft model. And really the best way to make sure um, because a, that, that it's a quality model is um, by making sure that we have gathered the right information in the first place. And it's important to take this step because as we'll see in a, in a moment, these models are being used to make really pretty significant decisions, or at least to inform those decisions. And so it's very important that we get them right. So we start by really carefully mining any transactional data that may be available. This is a lot easier now than it was when we started. The quality of the data has been getting better and better and better. And we've also gotten a little bit smarter about how we use it to the point now where we actually have code written, we've done enough of these, <laughs> these models now over the years, that we have code written that takes the data um, that Jim, Jim's team will provide to us, pull it, pulls it in, and it pulls out from that what the arrivals are, uh, length of stay patterns for the patients in each area, which areas of the department they visit in what sequence, and their discharge information. And from that, we can get a good heads up, um, big, good start on a basic model. If we have any problems with the data, anything that looks funny, then we might have to supplement sometimes with some manual data time studies. Again, that used to happen a lot more frequently than it does now. And in any case, we always make sure that we check with the people on the ground, the frontline staff, administrators, because they, you know, they live that process every day and they understand what's going on. So it's really important to check our, um, is what the data shows us to be actually happening in the clinics. Then we, the next step is, after that we've got a pretty good basic model, we'll verify the model by following simulated patients through the system. So we'll kind of watch, you know, as you notice a lot of our models are color coded. So we'll watch to make sure, do we have acute care patients ending up in the acute care area? Are they staying there for about the right period of time? Are they going from there to the observation unit in the percentages that they should be? Once we've done that kind of back of the envelope checking of the system, then we get into more serious validation of the model. And in that, we're essentially looking at, did the baseline model predict the same performance that we really see in the main system? So how do we, how do we know when to trust the model? Um, I think um, Jim would agree with me on this, that we could go around and around forever trying to get a perfect model. But a lot of times we don't need perfect to get the answer that we need out of the system. Instead, it's more important that it's looking and feeling like the real system to the people involved. It's responding in the right way, kind of rough order of magnitude and direction. Um, which is not to say that the models don't get quite accurate. They actually often do. But in order to check this, we're usually looking at, do we have the right number of arrivals of each patient in each part of the system? If you don't have that part right, then there's not much hope that any of the rest of it is going to work out correctly. Then the next measure that I really like to look at is the hourly census pattern. And the reason that we choose that one is because it is reflective of actually a combination of input um, metrics. So the census pattern is not likely to be right unless you've got your arrivals correct, your pathways have to be correct, and the amount of time that patients spend in each area has to be correct for the census patterns to work out. This is also something that is pretty easy to show to staff and they'll recognize it intuitively as being looking approximately right or not. Next we look at another of the classic simulation outputs and that's waiting time. So are they waiting where they should be in for the right period of time? 
And finally is the overall time and system. So, you know, door in and tell disposition, uh, not disposition decision, but actually disposition when they leave the department. Is that time about right for the various classes of patients that we have been tracking in the system? But perhaps most important of all, especially if this is a model that is being used to make real decisions, which they should be, otherwise why build them, <laughs> is does the clinical and administrative staff believe the model? And I just want to make the point that on any model of any real complexity at all, it's very, very common that the initial model doesn't validate particularly well. But this can actually be a useful factor. Um, we've had many, many cases over the years where the model said that something should be true, and it turned out that there was an element in the process that the data wasn't showing that we weren't picking up correctly, and that actually uncovered some problems um, that were really had not been visible before. Um, and, and also the fact that it doesn't validate right away is kind of proof that you need, you need to do it. This is just a kind of a rough conglomeration of some of the things that we look at. So the, to get the high level numbers right, we are now in the habit of creating a validation report that is automatically populated at the end of the simulation. So we'll create historical numbers and have them side by side with what was happening in the real system and what does the model predict and we'll look to see how well they match up. So in this particular example, which I just grabbed from a random scenario, we'll see that the turnaround times were looking about right and everything else was good, but our walkout rates were off by a fair amount. And it turns out that, uh, and that's what left this, uh, this means left without being seen and this is seen and left. So these numbers actually turn out to be fairly important ones to, to look at. When the model's well validated, these numbers tend to match up pretty well. And they also respond to interventions in the model in much the same way that they would in real life. Once we have the high level numbers right, then we like to look at some of the intraday patterns. So this is a little heat map that we include in, in all of our models that look at what are the utilization numbers for each area over the time of day. And of course, this is by half hour period, by day of week, by area of the ED. So I've just grabbed a little section here to say that you know we can look at, oh, we get really busy. Excuse me, that was, <laughs> got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, it's really, really busy at this time of day and lighter at a different time of day, and that should match the experience in the department. And finally, this graph at the bottom here is a sample uh, census graph for the main ED, and this shows some percentile bands. So we can see what this not only shows what the average level is at a certain time of day, but it also shows what the range of typical values are. And my experience has been that the administrative and frontline staff are able to recognize whether that feels correct or not. So now we get to move on to what, what I think is the, the, fun, the fun part, because I love these models, but actually using these models for making decisions. And so what I would like to do is just run through a few uh, representative examples across the years. And I want to start with um, first an overview of the sorts of information that all emergency department models tend to give us. First and foremost, um, and Eric did talk about some of this already, so I'll just do it quickly, but first and foremost, they help us look at what is the performance expected to be now and in the future. And we look at all of the classic results like the left without being seen numbers, bed utilization numbers, wait times, and census levels. On top of that, these models also help us take a lens to what might be some potential trouble spots. So we have learned over time that there is kind of a cliff, and I'll, I'll get to this more in a little bit, about um, where the utilization numbers of the beds, and that's again the percentage of time that the beds are occupied. Uh, there's a, what I think of as a red zone, where if you're in that area and trying to stay in that area, you end up being, the department ends up being highly reactive to any process changes, any volume changes, or basically any changes at all. And so it's important to know if your department is getting close to that area, even if the symptoms aren't quite yet present yet. And finally, these models are always helping us make business cases and providing evidentiary ex objective support for any changes that are being considered. So 
the first case study uh, that we'll start with is Howard County General Hospital. Um, now, Johns Hopkins has three emergency departments um, that they run. Howard County is a smaller community hospital in Howard County, Maryland. Jim had the foresight to say, you know what, let's, let's start on a less complex um, area that we have some throughput questions around. Let's get it set up there. And then he also had the vision to say, let's build a robust template that we can then take from Howard County and tweak the parameters and move it forward to the other more complex EDs in the system. And it's turned out that that approach has been what we continue to use today. Um, that template has grown over the year to now it not only is useful to apply to the Johns Hopkins EDs, but we've actually used it with EDs um, across the world and enables us to turn around models much, much faster than we used to. And again, I trace it all back to the work that started here at Howard County Hospital. And another great thing about that approach is it made us have to think about what are the key elements of the process. So each of these emergency departments in their final form might look very different from the others, but they still each have a fast track area, they have an acute care area, they have um, patient arrival patterns that are different by time of day. So if we abstract out what are those elements that we need to have in models, it really gets us a long way down the road to creating the next one. So at Howard County, I'm, I'm not going to go over all of these in detail, um, but I did want to say that there were many, many possible changes and interventions that we looked at for Howard County. Um, we looked at adding a psych pod. We looked at changing the fast track schedule, reducing uh, process times for various um, ancillary services or the wait for an inpatient bed. And after all of that, there were some changes made. I know um, off the top of my head that they did end up adding a psych pod and did make the changes in the fast track. And in, in all of those cases, the model, the, the real system did experience changes that were quite similar to what the model had predicted. So that gave us some confidence to go ahead and, and keep using it moving forward. From Howard County, we then went up to the next hospital um, in sort of in complexity, and that would be the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Bayview is a trauma center. In that uh, hospital, we did a number of uh, process improvement projects over the years, um, and Eric was highly involved in several of those, and uh, they really did a lot of work to get their process down and uh, really functioning well. And then most recently, they ha it became clear that the, their forecasted demands were not really going to be well served from the existing capacity that they had. So they had to look at how many rooms would they need to have in their expanded facility in order to handle their future projections. So the groundbreaking for that new ED uh, is happening any moment now. I'm not sure if it has happened yet, but um, it was supposed to happen spring uh, 2013, and the simulation model was used to help inform those decisions. So this is a slide that Jim was uh, kind enough to share with me about the facility size demand analysis, and this is just to show how the results of the simulation might be presented to the executive committee about, look, we, we examined, here's our current volume, this is the number of beds that we have, here's how many beds it appears that we need for optimal performance now with our current volume, and now let's look at some future volume scenarios and see how we do there. Um, ultimately, they recommended a bed level uh, in between these two of about 55 beds uh, for the near term and 60 to 62 to uh, enable some future growth. And then you might wonder, well, why? You know, how did we pick those numbers out of the hat? Well, we looked at uh, performance statistics from the simulation models at each of these different levels and examined which one gives us the performance level where we wanted to be. Um, I had actually forgotten to, until we looked at these recently that we ended up looking at uh, utilization numbers in the low 70s. And based on a lot of recent work that we've done, um, that was, I think this was a level that intuitively felt right to Jim and the other executives. It turns out that we have provided, the simulation models more recently have provided a lot of support for targeting an area um, in that low 70 range if possible for utilization because especially in a complex ED with a lot of variation. 
Which brings us to the Johns Hopkins Hospital, which, um, as many of you I'm sure know, is an inner city uh, trauma center that has um, a very complex and fairly acute patient population. And um, I'll show in a second what the situation was, but there have been through the years, again, many throughput improvement interventions considered. We look at all the usual things that we've been talking about before and, in fact, more recently about capacity reallocation or addition, dwell time reductions, and dwell time is, um, some of you might know, as length of stay. Um, that refers to the amount of time that patients spend in each bed in the department, whereas length of stay is the terminology they use for the time from in the door till leaving the department. We looked at um, a variety of practice changes, uh, even down to including could we do something to uh, perhaps shift some of our very low acuity patients elsewhere temporarily, and even looking at the processes improvement between the departments. The ultimate goal uh, was to try to work toward a zero weight ED. So some of the recent work that we've been doing is examining, well, here's the reality of this department. We understand the capacity we have. We understand their complex patient department. What would it take to get to the ideal of a zero weight ED? So here, here's what the situation is like here. I, I like this graph because it shows um, pretty clearly, if you know what you're looking at, what um, the situation is. So this curve here, this, this blue one that has a very obvious uh, trough and a peak, is the utilization for the trauma area. So if I were to lay on top of this the arrival pattern for the department, it looks awfully similar to this. This is when um, the arrivals start to peak in the late morning, then they reach a relatively high level that they maintain until the evening, at which point they start dropping off. We have seen this in emergency departments throughout the world. It's a very common pattern. But what EDs that are not you know, really overwhelmed get to see is that their utilization of the areas of the ED also drop. Here, they're maintained at a very high level. So this is why you start seeing walkouts that are a little bit higher than you might like and why some of the interventions aren't immediately um, effective because you've got so much pent up demand. You know, if you never drop below 100% when your population peaks, it means you're going to be turning away or patients are going to start walking out. So let's look at some of the things we might change. Well, one of the first things we might change is let's try adding another bed or two. Um, this is a relatively new facility, and there was the possibility of adding, especially in the wrap and short trap areas, which are intended for rapid assessment and turnaround of patients. So the wrap area is actually used for most patients to do an initial assessment before moving to a main ED bed, and the super track is for um, very low acute patients that can be turned around quickly. And if we look at those curves, we can see that adding a room or two there provides some pretty pretty steep reduction in the time to a first bed, which was an important um, metric there. Part of that is because, as we'll see, it all comes down to utilization. And because they had relatively few beds to begin with, adding another bed or two does a lot to push their utilization into a sustainable range. But still, even with all of that utilization um, improvement, we're still not getting to where we want to be. Even with adding a very large number of beds, we're still not getting to where we want to be in the zero weight ED. So what if we try looking to reducing the time to the first bed by dwell time reductions? And again, that's the amount of time that patients spend in each area. So we ran a number of scenarios again and looked at, well, what if we play around with reducing dwell time by pretty large amounts in each of the areas? Does that get us where we want to be? want to be. And even at 30%, which is pretty, that'd be a pretty miraculous process change that could get us down that far, um, that's still alone not going to get us where we want to be. So then we thought, okay, let's look at combining the patients. Well, in this curve shows the combination of factors that are necessary to get 95% of the patients to their first bed within 30 minutes, which, you know, when you consider triage and a minor amount of waiting, is getting pretty close to a zero ADD. And we'll see that even here, you can start to do a little bit better, but you still have to go pretty far 
either in adding beds or reducing your dwell time in order to approach that. And it all comes down to this curve. So uh, Jim noticed um, a while back, and some of his staff members noticed, that when the overall patient length of stay in the department was under a given threshold, everything worked great. Um, they didn't have patients backing up. Um, uh, the flow was smooth, and everything just worked perfectly. But if they got above that threshold, things went bad really quickly. And he phrased it as falling off a cliff. Well, it turns out that what he had, had intuitively observed is actually mathematically true. And it turns out that the threshold, the length of stay threshold that he had observed, equates to a point on the utilization curve of right about here. Um, in the low 70s. And if you stay on this side of the curve, everything works great. And if you don't, you start seeing very rapid drops in the number of patients who are able to get through without waiting. And so this was um, a, a good insight that we were able to see. Even though this is a classic operations research curve and everybody's seen it, it was very instructive to see with the parameters of this specific system, because this number, you know, where the where the cliff is, is going to differ a little bit depending on the specifics of the department that you're working on. It turns out for this one, it's in the low 70s, and that's very important to know. So the final scenario, and and one of the favorites that we looked at was looking at some of the interdepartment process changes. There was an observation that the boarding time, the time it took patients to actually get to an inpatient bed once it was determined that they needed one, had been increasing, increasing, increasing. And the department was actually planned for a lower level than what they had been experiencing. And so we looked at various um, scenarios of what if we could get the boarding time down to you know, an average of certain levels or 95th percentile, so where 95% of the cases were less than that level, what would that do to our overall performance improvement? And it turns out that it did a great deal. And it was um, one of the interventions that we found that had the biggest likely impact. And that information, along with some good animated simulation models, um, see, I think I have, oh, not that one. Um, we're able to see this is a animation of the reduced boarding time scenario where, again, I don't have, I don't have time to show the, the base case, but this starts to look pretty good and manageable. And uh, perhaps we can talk more about this in just a second. But this was very useful to be able to show talk to the Department of Medicine about these these are the changes that would be useful. And if we're able to work together to get down to a consistent level, here's what um, we can accomplish in the ED. So just in summary, uh, as far as the lessons learned, I just want to reiterate that we want to start simple and build from there. We learned that it's very useful if you have multiple EDs in your system, or even if you think that you're going to be using the models over and over again, take the time to build a robust, easy-to-use interface. Um, you will find that it not only makes it faster to run the models that you do run, but it also makes it so that you can turn to the simulation faster. You know, it's not quite such a production every time you want to do a simulation model if you've set, taken the time to set it up front. Model building, as Eric said, can provide enormous value just by getting the team to think through all of the aspects of the process. So the discussions that we have to have and the explorations that have to go on in order to build one of these models does goes a long way towards illuminating um, how to best improve them. Um, as we've said, it's really useful for presenting these ideas to senior management. And finally, with all of the talk about validation and how to best present these models, I also want to make the point that it's OK to start with less than perfect data. Um, but just understand, validate the model enough to know how far you can trust the results of the model. 
there are some models where we say, well, we can't get it to validate perfectly, usually because there's some part of the process that is too complex that the data is not available for. But we can still use that as a base to study the delta. So as long as you're aware of what the weaknesses are, it's still much better than throwing your hands up in the air and saying, I'm just going to guess this is what the output will be. Sometimes the models give results that are non-intuitive. Um, sometimes that's because there's a problem in the model, but we've seen over and over again, it's because there's an element of the system's performance that people hadn't recognized before. So if you get a strange result in your model, don't necessarily uh, throw it out as wrong. It could be that it's trying to tell you something new about your model. Look beyond um, immediate obvious symptoms because it could be that what's causing the problems is several steps either behind you or in front of you. And so don't be afraid to look at your interactions with other departments or other parts of the process. Um, and finally, again, um, these are just looking at testing the ideas before implementation, estimating uh, results in a risk-free environment, and pointing out issues that hadn't been recognized. It's just so useful. So I, I want to take another second to thank Jim Shulin and his team. Um, Scott, as, as Eric also mentioned, is a, a faculty member who has supported, specializes in simulation, and he has supported a lot of our work. Tammy Miller, Guy Cole are members on Jim's team who helped us get a lot of information. And then I also want to acknowledge Jarrett Hauge, who's my partner here at Novasim, who did a large amount of the hard coding um, on these models. So I'm going to turn this over for um, question and answers. But before we do that, I would love to invite Jim, if you if we've missed anything or if there's anything you want to add, um, feel free to, to jump in. Uh, thanks, Carrie, and thanks, Eric. This was, I thought, just a fabulous presentation and an unbelievable summary of, uh, of about 10 years worth of work. Um, for everybody else, I think, uh, you know, this this, uh, healthcare has really gotten to a point where we can't afford to, um, I'll just say, mismanage scarce resources. I think it used to be that uh, bed space, emergency department space, and all of the other resources that we have, uh, frankly, weren't so scarce, and we and we operated at utilization rates where we didn't have to we didn't have to manage things down to the level that other industries have probably had to manage for some time. But with the you know ongoing um, cost reductions and other restrictions within the healthcare environment, clearly all of our resources are getting to be very precious and scarce. And so I think we need to start using this kind of tool to make sure we're getting the most, uh, the highest performance we can out of the most reasonable uh, amount of resources. So, so I think I'll just stop there. And, and again, thank you for Harry and for uh, Eric doing such an uh, incredible summary of what we've been working on. Hey, thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. Thanks, one, Jim. Thank you for that. And uh, <clears throat> just to add my thanks again to to Kerry and and to Eric for for as, you know to repeat what Jim was saying. Uh, an incredible uh, look at almost the life cycle of a, a simulation project. Um, and we have some time, as I say, for for some questions. Um, any questions we don't get to, then we will uh, get back to you personally with those. And I just, well, I guess this is to, and it's great to have Jim on the line for this one, actually. This is to Eric. Um, and it's really uh, an overriding theme from, from people uh, just starting out on a simulation uh, journey you know, within, within their, their hospital or their, their ED. And you, you spoke quite, quite a bit about having a, a, being lucky enough to have a, a project champion like, like Jim. Uh, on the team, and um, for for those who, who aren't as fortunate, um, which it appears that, that, that not many are, um, what is there any advice that you could possibly give to to them to to you know, create them or almost to to sell sell the idea or the concept? To any any steps or advice that you could give? Well, I think that one of the things that I've found is if if you haven't identified anybody who really is that champion. If you can show successes in other areas of the of your organization that you've used the tool and try to sort of evangelize, I think that that, that can help. Um, you know, obviously, there's projects that we get involved in, and when you're assessing it and, and, you know, talking to that champion, 
and they're not very clear in what they want, there's ways that you can sort of steer them and, and educate them. And, you know, frankly, there's times where we have to say this may not be the right time to do this if we don't have a lot of buy-in. Um, I think it's important that people, especially on the executive level, don't get caught up into the flavor of the week type of thing and think, well, everybody else is doing this, so let's just do this and it'll, it'll work. You really have to believe in it and understand how it works. So, um, you know, I wish I had a magic wand where we could just turn people to, to see the benefits of it, but I think it's a lot of educating, a lot of convincing and selling, basically. Even when it, like for myself as an internal consultant, um, it's getting people to realize the value in it. Well, I would actually like to, to ask Jim, I mean, I think maybe Jim could comment on what parts of it do you find most useful when you're making decisions from the... Well, well, honestly, I think it's because the the, the results are, are very clear. And so if you ask the right question, which I think is probably the key, if you ask the right question, then um, you not only get a kind of a yes, no, this makes sense answer, but you even get a sense of scale. And so uh, I've just found that it just it just gives you uh, just makes you comfortable with with the, the, the decision making process more than just uh, you know even if you run a very good lean project and everybody accepts uh, management tools that we have now as the way to approach a problem but even a, a lean project uh, with good statistical analysis will only give you the results of the statistical analysis. It won't let you know, it won't really draw you a picture of what your whole operation will look like. And that's what I think this uh, discrete event simulation does that's different. Great, thanks. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, and I would love to carry on this discussion, but I know we're um, getting close to time. So I think what we'll do is um, get back to, to everyone individually uh, with the, with the uh, answers to the questions. And um, Kerry, if you could skip on a slide uh, just now. Um, as uh, just a few notes, I mean, as uh, Eric noted, um, the well, recording will be available on simweek.com, and I'll send that round right to everyone. Um, but they've also uh, just had a paper published in the Journal of Healthcare Management, um, Discrete Event Simulation for Healthcare Organisations, uh, a tool for decision making. I would encourage you to, um, for any further reading, to um, get over there and, and see, um, take a read at that. Um, next slide, please, Kerry. And also to um, Eric and Kerry have been uh, kind enough to uh, give their contact details uh, to to let you let anyone get in touch who had any questions um, just about the work they've been doing or you know to get any advice um, as uh, Eric and Kerry and Jim just gave there so please feel free to do that and that just gives me time to uh, tell about our next workshop which is in May um, and that's from Todd Roberts uh, Memorial Health System uh, it's on May 15th at 11 a.m. again. And that's on ensuring the feasibility of a, well, they just went through a $31 million OR expansion project. Um, so uh, really just testing the feasibility of architectural plans and a really interesting case on where simulation has been used to, to, to test the feasibility, as I say, but to make sure everything uh, is in order for that. So please, um, I'll send out a note for that, but please do come along to that. Uh, next slide, Kerry. And if you do have any uh, other topics, or if you would like to be involved in the uh, the, uh, the workshops, then please do get in touch and uh, contact myself, or or you can continue the discussion on the the simulating health LinkedIn group. Um, so again, please feel free to to get in touch and move on there. Uh, and just please be again to thank everyone uh, for coming along today. Uh, thank you to uh, Kerry uh, and Eric and, and of course to Jim. And uh, thanks, everyone. I'll be in touch with uh, the recording. And um, thank you again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.